Yeah, hello and welcome everybody to our live demo today. Our topic today will be uh, live, uh, will be full forcing. So one of the two major um, options to define our meteorological boundary conditions in NVMED. Um, and we will be covering the following agenda today. At first, I will quickly um, explain some differences between the simple forcing option, which is one of the two major things to, to use as meteorological boundary condition in NVMED. Um, and then we will make a short uh, Q&A um, if there are already some questions. Then we will um, cover the EPW file import and talk about what are the features of EPW files and where they come from and uh, what they do they help us with. Um, and then also a Q short Q&A session. And as a third uh, topic for today, there will be the import of the CSV files. So your own measurement data in the end. And I will start sharing my screen so that we quickly see the general concept of NVMED. So we have um, in the center of the model area, which you all know. So this is the 3D information of all objects, buildings, trees, etc. Um, and also the soil model below it. And on the left hand side, we can see that we don't always not only have the 3D model area in the middle, but also a one dimensional um, model, so, so, so to say, um, at the borders. So that is what we are trying to define by these meteorological boundary conditions. So what is the inflow for our model? Um, and this one dimensional uh, model here needs to be filled with somehow data that we gather somewhere, um, either from measurement stations or such um, EPW files, which we see in, in a second. Um, to get the data and import it and then use it in our microclimate model and then use it as inflow condition for our microclimate simulation. And to know why there are advantages or disadvantages of uh, full, forcings, full forcing, we have to first um, take a look at simple forcing so that we know which option does what and what are advantages and disadvantages. Um, so I just opened the envy guide here, which you probably all know. Um, where we set the general settings for a model area location, for example, load the model area file, INX file here, um, and set the start date and start time and simulation duration, of course. And by that, we already define in simple forcing, which are the radiation conditions for that specific day. For example, here, the pre-defaults are, uh, the defaults values are 1st of July and starting at five in the morning. And by that information, together with the model area location, a model animat can define the radiation conditions. So how much solar radiation is there, um, how much solar radiation is received and then reflected and so on. But we have to define, of course, the general temperature. So the 1st of July can be a very hot day, for example, in Europe, or it can be, of course, a winter day in, southern, uh, in the southern hemisphere. So we have to define not only by the model area location, but also by the weather conditions, which kind of day shall it be? Shall it be a very hot European summer day or shall it, shall it be a rather cold European summer day? So that's why it's important to define some kind of weather conditions for our model area, for our simulation. And the simple forcing is, like the name already says, quite simple. So what you can do is defining a 24 hour cycle of temperature and humidity. And these both um, parameters are defined for the two meter height. Um, and as you can see, these values here in the graph come from this table here. So all we need to define needs to be defined in this table. If I change a parameter here, for example, at eight in the morning, it shall be 25 degrees Celsius. Um, the graph is updated and we see that this temperature is now reflected here in the graph. Um, the graph itself is only supporting tool it only helps you to understand um, how your temperature evolves during the day, um, but you cannot change the values here. It's only helper tool, uh, like these um, options here where we can set the minimum, um, the time of the minimum air temperature four in the morning and maximum temperature maybe at uh, 14 o'clock and it ranges from 15 degrees to, I don't know, 35 degrees. We can set that here and update the values and the graph as well so that we can see the diurnal cycle of temperature and humidity. And you probably say, and you're right, that this is a very simplistic approach because it's very, um, yeah, it's a linear uh, development. And of course, nature is not a linear development. 
So you could go into the table here and change these values manually so that you have a more realistic um, evolution of temperature and humidity. Um, besides these values, uh, we can also define the specific humidity in 2.5 kilometers height in gram per kilogram. Um, there are often questions about it because um, it's not a very native parameter. Um, for the air temperature and two meters height, people always have an idea because they measured it in their own garden, for example, and they know, okay, 30 degrees Celsius is pretty warm, um, but eight gram per kilogram and 2,500 meters height, what is this value? Is that very humid or not? Um, so to give you some idea, it's, um, yeah, for, uh, I would say, um, normal European conditions, for example, eight gram per kilogram is more or less the default. If you are in a desert region and in arid regions, you might only have three to five gram per kilogram. If you are in very humid regions, I don't know, in subtropical areas, you might um, enter 12 or maybe 15 gram per kilogram. Um, and that's a very um, special um, parameter because it defines how humid is the whole atmosphere in your, in your model area. Um, what is important is that we defined here the simple forcing conditions for this 24 hour cycle of one specific simulation day. But if you simulate, for example, 48 hours, 72 hours, you know, three days, or maybe seven days, these 24 hour conditions are always applied for each day. Um, so they don't change. Um, and what's also not changing, not even hourly, but never during the whole simulation in simple forcing mode is wind speed and wind direction. As we can see here, default values are here two meters per second and 90 degrees inflow coming from the east the wind, uh, which you can of course change to maybe four meters per second if you want to have a, a high wind speed simulation or go down to, I don't know, 1.5 meters per second for a low wind situation and maybe change it to southern direction. 180 degrees, but it is constant during the whole course of the simulation. Russell's length uh, can be kept as, as default value because, um, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, very, um, yeah, it, it defines the, the wind inflow profile and, and um, yeah, it can be kept at 0 0.01, it's often uh, asking for as well. Um, what is also pretty um, default is the cloud coverage. Um, because usually people want to simulate clear sky conditions um, to compare heat stress conditions in scenario A compared to the scenario B, where we have some kind of countermeasures, counter measures, measures um, like trees, um, greenings for facades or roofs, um, changing any kind of building structure, for example. And to see if there's a lot of heat stress in a scenario, we of course need clear sky conditions. Of course, there are also heat stress conditions if there are clouds, for example. But the use case, I would say, is that we have a cloud-free situation. And uh, if we don't want to simulate the clear sky conditions and say, OK, it's a cloudy day, we have to know that in simple forcing mode, we enter, for example, four of eight, so half of the sky is, is covered by clouds, um, that these conditions are present for the whole simulation period. So it, never changes. So it's cloudy during the day, during morning, midday, afternoon, and all night. And that's the specific of simple forcing because all of these parameters are more or less constant. Um, and that might be the disadvantage or the drawback by simple forcing because you can um, easily start a simulation, easily define all these settings and quickly start a simulation and you'll get some results and you can quickly simulate a cloud-free day and a very hot day, and then compare scenarios against, against each other. Mm, but you are not um, as free and as um, specific uh, as in full forcing, which we can see in a second. Yeah? Um, because if we now change from simple forcing to full forcing, I will do that here in the Envy Guide using the different um, meteorology option. Yeah, Not use simple forcing anymore, but use full forcing. It says, gives us a, a warning that it will be changed. And now we would have um, a list of full uh, forcing files that we created previously to be selected here in the NV guide. But I created a new project. There are no FOX files present. So we will now have the job to create these FOX files. Um, and they can come from different sources. And we will see two of these sources um, in, in a second. So I will now switch to the forcing manager where we are able to 
define our um, our full, full forcing file to be used in a simulation. Um, and if you are if you have any questions, feel free to to um, ask them in the comment uh, comment section, um, and I will answer them in the Q and A uh, session um, after the EBW import, which is coming next. Um, so this is our uh, forcing manager um, when we don't um, have loaded anything yet. Yeah. So we see that we have a calendar here going from January to December, and it's all gray. So nothing is loaded yet. And usually, usually uh, when opening the forcing manager, we are starting in the start tab. Yeah. So you would be able to create a new fox file, open a fox file that we created previously, um, save our fox file. Um, but that's it. Yeah? So what we usually have to do is go into the data tab and import our data coming from any of these sources that we see in a second. And the import from CSV file is a bit more complex, um, but also a bit more interesting probably. Um, but the first and more basic thing is importing a so-called EPW file or TRY file. So I'll click on that. Um, and that is pretty simple because we just need that kind of file to be imported. And you can see I, only, uh, I downloaded a file already, but where do I get such a file and what is that file? Um, for that, I will just quickly move into um, a browser like Firefox. And then I, uh, then you can see that I searched for EPV, EPW file download already. So there are multiple sources where you can download such files. One of them is, I think, the best website to do that. And that is here the EPW uh, map yeah, from the Ladybug tools. Open that. And we can see that there are lots of dots. There's a lot of dots um, over the whole world. So each of these dots is such, an, uh, such a file that we can use as import for microplanet simulation in Animat. So basically, the whole world is covered by meteorological data, and we just have to download it and access it to use it in our simulation. What are these EPW files? Um, these files are called Energy Plus Weather Files. Um, and Energy Plus is a building performance simulation tool. So that's a different scale than Animat. Animat is, of course, a micro scale uh, model. Um, but BPS simulations um, are on the building scale only. So they cover um, not the outdoor thermal, outdoor thermal comfort, but the indoor thermal comfort mostly. Energy consumption for air conditioning, for example, or heating in, in winter time. Um, these are some questions that, that are um, solved by BPS simulations. Um, and they are not covering only a few days, like we do in microclimate simulations, but they cover usually a whole year because of that problematic situation that we have um, when we um, build a, a building that uh, is very um, storing heat very good. Um, then we um, have less problems in winter time because we don't have to heat that much. But we have, of course, a problem in summertime. If there's a lot of heat stored in the building, then we would need a lot of energy to cool down the building again. So we would um, have drawbacks in summertime then, and otherwise, uh, vice versa, the other way around. We would have, of course, problems if the heat is released very quickly. Then we have a problem in wintertime when we have to heat a lot. Um, so that is why these simulations are usually year-long simulations. Uh, and these files that are provided for such a simulation are, of course, also year-long then. Yeah? So they are more or less averaged conditions um, for these specific locations on Earth um, for each specific day. So, But you have to know that it is not, for example, the last year and each day of the last year, but averaged conditions. So. Um, maybe the January comes from 1990, and uh, February comes from 19, 1985, and uh, March comes from 2005. Um, and so it's stacked together, yeah? so that we get a year-long file. And it's more or less a reanalysis data. So these data sets are applied to each other so that we have a result, um, yeah, a whole, whole year of data. Um, and on the left-hand side, we can see that there are lots of different sources. So there are different um, modeling tools that provide um, such data for us. Um, what we usually use for our models, if we do something in Europe, for example, um, we use these uh, blue dots because we found that they are pretty reliable. Um, and um, yeah, 
I don't know about other regions in the world, so you might have to look into that a uh, bit deeper, um, which, for example, is in South America the best um, uh, source for such data. Um, but I will just exemplarily download a file here for uh, Frankfurt, download that file, and receive such a zip file here. And if within the zip file, we find the EPW file, which is now located here in my project folder. I just zipped it uh, just before the live demo and um, dropped it in here. And we may, maybe we just have a look at the data, which is included here. And open that in Notepad++. And what we see here is a very big file. So of course, there's a lot of data in it, a whole year, um, but also lots of different columns that we see in a data set. So in the top, um, we find some information about the location and where the data is coming from. And then it starts here with the data. Yeah. So we see here, this is the 1st January of 1984. And these are the hours, first hour, second hour, third hour, and so on. This is some yeah, code. Um, then we see some um, columns here about the direct radiation. Here we see the nighttime hour zero, and then it goes up because in January in, in, in Frankfurt, we have only a few daylight um, hours with solar radiation going up to 400 watts per square meter and nighttime hours again, zero. And also there's coming the, the temperature, of course, wind speed, wind direction. So we have lots of parameters in there, which is helpful, which we can see in a second in, in the full forcing then. Um, and we wrote an import file, import uh, structure for these EPW files here. And if we open it in our um, in our importer here in Forcing Manager, we open it here. The data is loaded and already transferred in our Fox file structure. So all of these days here were not gray anymore, but now green, and of course, it's only a color change, yeah. But the data is now um, stored, of course, for each of these days. And if I click on such a day, for example, 12th of July, yeah, we can now have a look at the data. And I think that's pretty important to do that because we want to usually take a specific day for our simulations. Um, some people um, come and say, okay, I need um, a specific day because our project partners want us to simulate the 1st of July. And then they open the 1st of July and say, okay, I have to take the 1st of July. Now that's the data and I will work with this data no matter what. But I would be careful about that because if we now had take a look at the 1st of July, for example, which is well, uh, not planned, but very bad day for simulating in my, in my opinion, um, because as I said, as I told you before, I think usually we want to simulate heat stress, right? And heat stress is, of course, coming with high solar radiation values, direct solar radiation values. No? Um, a cloudy day doesn't help us very much in this case because, for example, the shading provided by trees or shading devices um, is, of course, um, not as effectful or maybe has no effect at all if there is no direct solar radiation, right? Um, and we can see here in the 1st of July in this specific file here um, that we have high diffuse radiation values here in orange. A rather low or nearly no um, direct short wave radiation in yellow, and we yeah, are just more or less fluctuating normal um, long wave radiation values around 380 watts per square meter, so that would be fine. Um, but the low direct solar radiation and the rather high diffuse solar radiation tell us that there's a very it's, it was a very cloudy di cloudy day in that in that um, in the data set. Yeah? And the other thing would be um, 1st of July, a European summer day, we would normally um, expect very high temperatures, maybe up to 35, 30 degrees Celsius, and very high nighttime temperatures so that we have nighttime heat stress as well. Um, but we see here, for example, ranging temperatures from 14 degrees nighttime up to 23 degrees daytime. And we also see very problematic wind speed situations right here. Yeah? So in dark, we can see the wind speed zero for two time, uh, two time steps of the of the EPW file here in one o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning, uh, which is of course impossible to be simulated. Yeah? And we met as a CFD model, computational fluid dynamics model. Without a flow, there is no modeling, right? So um, we need some kind of wind speed and there are some minimum values, for example, 0 0.5 meters per second. I think that's, that's the current minimum, um, but yeah. We need some kind of wind flow to have any reasonable results, right? 
And during daytime, on the other hand, it raises up to 6.5 meters per second, which is a lot. Yeah? I told you before, around 4 meters per second, 4.5 meters per second is a very strong wind speed situation in, in the Met. Yeah? So 6.5 meters per second is nearly at the, um, at the range where um, we have problems regard, regarding turbulence, right? Um, so that would be a very problematic day if we want to force these specific parameters. Yeah? But we see we have a diurnal cycle of temperature and humidity. We have a diurnal cycle of radiation, yeah? direct radiation, um, diffuse radiation, longer radiation, and we have a diurnal cycle of wind speed and direction. And that is the very great thing about full forcing. We can change these parameters for each time step of the simulation. And it's different from day to day. So it can be a simulation ranging from 1st of July to 2nd, 3rd July. And all of these days will feature different conditions. If I go to the 2nd of July, we have different conditions again. It's even a cooler day. Then the simulation goes on into the 3rd of July. And we see still a cloudy day and even colder, 15 degrees only. Yeah? But the, uh, the, the conditions change from day to day. So we simulate more or less realistic conditions and not the very same conditions every day for our simulation, like we do in simple forcing. Right? Um, so what we usually do in our simulations is we go through the data and don't pick a specific date. We don't always simulate the 18th of June or the 1st of June or something like that. We go through the data for the model area location that we want to simulate and check for a day which is cloud free. Yeah? So I know from experience that this file is yeah, more or less uh, well suited for our purpose yeah um, but the 6th of july is pretty good yeah so there's a, um, as you can see here in the, in the um, yellow shortwave direct um, radiation um, curve um, that there are no clouds yeah so the solar radiation is, is coming in very clearly and um, diffuse radiation is rather low 150 watts per square meter so that would be um, kind of data set that would i that i would take for our simulation um, if we want to simulate something near frankfurt yeah and also the potential temperatures ranging from 70 degrees nighttime up to 31 degrees. So it's a typical European summer day, right? But wind speed is again a bit problematic. Maybe we want some kind of these conditions sometimes where we have very low wind speeds during nighttime or rather low wind speeds during nighttime at 1.5 meters per second, going up to 4.5 meters per second. Um, but I would say that's not the use case. Yeah. Sometimes we want to change the wind speed situation, and sometimes we want that the wind direction change, changes during the course of the simulation, um, so that in morning hours we have the wind coming from north, and during nighttime or afternoon it come, uh, comes in from the south. But usually um, we are interested in the diurnal cycle of temperature and that there's solar direct radiation, and it's kind of a different factor that comes in if we also change wind speed and direction. Um, and to avoid that, we usually take constant parameters for wind speed and direction, especially if they are in such a great range of wind speed values um, and wind direction is changing drastically. Yeah? Here we see that the, da the data sets shows only a small range of wind direction changes, um, only from, uh, we can see here, from 20 degrees up to 160 degrees and over a long period. So that would be fine. Sometimes we have data sets where the wind direction changes very quickly and within one hour from zero degrees to 180 degrees. Um, and that's much for the model. So the turbulence model is not uh, built for that, that the wind speed changes that drastically. Um, so in, this, in these cases, we would recommend to not force the wind speed, but force temperature, humidity, and radiation conditions. And that's something that's not happening in the forcing manager directly. So what we do, would do now is we would save the FOX file. I will save it here in our live demo project folder. Go back to the envy guide, refresh my folder, and then we find that here is our forcing file that we just created. I will shift it over to our Simix file so that it is linked now to our file. And usually, the forcing data of our FOX file is also checked uh, against the simulation date and time that we entered in the beginning, here in general sections, right? Um, to see if the forcing file that we loaded um, is also present in the simulation um, time and date that we specified in the beginning. But if we load it from EPW files or TRY files, other data sets are, of course, also possible to be loaded. 
Um, then we have year long data. So we cannot choose a time period which is not covered by the forcing file, right? So in this time, uh, in this situation here, this check is not very, um, it's not needed at all. But it's of course done um, anyway. Uh, what I what, wanted to show you just to, to sum that up and end the EPW um, section and um, do a short Q&A afterwards and then going into the CSV file import. Um, I wanted to show you in the envy guide that we have now um, the option here to say not force the wind when we use this forcing file for our simulation. As I said, we have a long, uh, we have a large variation in wind speeds and also wind direction, and we would like rather have um, some constant wind speed inflow. Um, so we would not like to force the wind, but air temperature is fine, radiation is fine, and relative humidity is fine. Um, precipitation is something else, um, which yeah, maybe I can cover it as well now. Um, Precipitation is usually included in such EPW files. Um, and you could also, of course, add it to your ZSV import, which we see in a second. Um, but we cannot simulate precipitation as you might think that other models that other models do um, um, simulate such precipitation conditions. Um, it's nothing like a runoff of water in our model or like snow. Um, what we have is we can add the precipitation as water to the soil again. So if we simulate, for example, a dry and heat, a dry heat period um, where we have a lot of heat stress and the plants evaporate, transpirate a lot, the soil is, of course, very dry, very, very dry after a few days. And they cannot do their photosynthesis anymore. And of course, they do not cool the environment anymore if they don't get any more water. So what we could do then is we could add water again to the soil by using the precipitation. Um, if we do not force the wind, we have to set, of course, constant values for the wind speed and for the wind direction, as we saw before for simple forcing. Yeah? So if we disable some of these parameters here, we have to define constant values instead, of course, because we do need some kind of information for our inflow. right? And we could then define these conditions here, maybe check back if we want to simulate the, sixth, the, the, the date of 6th of July, we can check these values and see, OK, in, as a web average value, we might have around 2.5 meters per second coming in from 80 degrees. And we would then enter here 2.5 meters coming from 80 degrees and have that as constant wind speed and um, wind direction values. And of course, it does not help us to just say we want to simulate this Eight, 6th of July, we, we have to define that in the Envy Guide. So we have to go back to the general section, settings of our section here, and then change the value to the 6th of July here so that the simulation knows that it has to take the data from 6th of July out of the forcing file. Otherwise, it might take 1st of July because that is selected here, right? But I think that's, that's already pretty clear, right? Okay, so. Then I will make a short Q&A before we go back to importing uh, CSV files. Just ooh, endless loop of data. Oh, maybe. Do that back again and just share the comments here. Ah, very <laughs> easy restructured check session. Thanks. Thank you as well. <laughs> Um, hi, which data sources are best used for forcing? Um, yeah, that's a very good question because um, there are lots of um, data sources um, that can be accessed. For example, meteorological stations from cities or weather services like the German uh, weather service DVD, uh, DWD, um, to then create your CSV files for import or of course the EPW files uh, that can be imported, TRY files, which are test reference years can be imported. Um, we can also um, import files, of course, from other models. If we make a mesoscale simulation, for example, using WARF, weather and research forecast model, or COSMO, or ERA-5 data, um, we could take these data sets and somehow um, create a CSV file out of it, maybe by a short script or by a code um, in, in R, for example, or Python, or maybe create them in an Excel file, and then import these data sets as well, so that we have 
not only the information for one height level, but also for several height levels. Um, maybe at that point, just share my screen again before we make, um, we just have a look at the other questions as well. Um, maybe just have a quick look at forcing files because that fits now. Um, mm -hmm. Such a forcing file that we just created here is more or less a JSON file. So JSON files, there are libraries for it in, in all, lib in all um, kinds of uh, software um, languages, for example, R or Python, um, where you just have to load the JSON library and tell, them, tell the library, OK, we have to save um, location data, for example. Yeah? And we have to save an array of time steps, which would be here, the first time step of our forcing file that we just saved it. Um, and would we, which would be, uh, would be here the 1st of January, starting at 0 in the morning. Um, service radiation, you'll come to that in a second. The data source, which would now be the EPW file, because we loaded the data from EPW files. Shortwave direction, uh, shortwave direct radiation, diffuse radiation, longwave radiation, or clouds, if we have only cloud data, come to that in a second as well. Um, precipitation data, background pollutants, I will skip that because that's about the pollution tool and it's not yet available. Um, because we could then handle the background pollutants not only for the start of the simulation, but for all time steps where we update the uh, full forcing. And then we see that we have a so called T profile for the temperature, a Q profile for the specific humidity, a wind profile for wind speed and direction, and a P profile for pressure. That's also not very important yet because we have not made the switch in the, in the model from potential air temperature to absolute air temperature, where we would need the pressure, of course. So that's not important yet. But important is that we have these three things here, temperature profile, um, specific humidity profile, and wind profile. And my point here was that currently, we only import a specific height level, which is now here. We see height level of two meters from our data set from EPW data for temperature and humidity, and for wind speed, 10 meters right. And then we see the value here, which is then 277 Kelvin and 4.99 gram per kilogram and 4 meters per second, 220 degrees. Um, if we import such data from, for example, WARF or COSMO, other models, we would have, have, of course, different height levels as well. We would have a 2 meter height, a 10 meter height, a 20 meter height, a 50 meter height, a 1,000 1, meter height, up to our atmospheric top height level of 2,500 meters. So that would be, of course, much better if we have such data. But currently, our importer um, is um, enabling the import of one height level only. But if you have the data and you're able to make a short script, add your data there, add more height levels if you have the data. Yeah? So that would be a good option, I think. Hope that helps regarding the data sources question. Um, so if I set the same values in simple and full forcing, the simulation values will be, will, values will be the same outputs. Uh, no, <laughs> unfortunately not, um, because we have very different calculation routines um, between simple forcing and full forcing. Um, in full forcing, we take this value here, the temperature profile, um, we then take this 277 Kelvin for all height levels, um, because that's our potential air temperature value, and it will be applied up to the 2.5 um, um, kilo, uh, um, kilometers height level, um, which is different to the simple forcing approach, um, where we also um, do an average of all surfaces in, in the model area, um, and then calculate a heat exchange between the ground level and the two meter height level where we entered the air temperature value. And then we have a gradient coming from the surface and then going upwards. While we have in a full forcing file, we have these constant values applied to all of these heights. Maybe we'll add a, 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 an option in the future where we could change that from these isotherm atmospheric conditions um, to also these heat exchange conditions. Uh, we, we did some tests about that and um, yeah, also promising results. Both are fine options. So you, but if you wonder why there are differences, if you take the very same values in simple forcing and full forcing and there are different results, um, that's the reason why. Yeah? So there are different calculation routines setting up our inflow boundary conditions. 
Thank you for the session. In addition to the 1D boundary conditions that is created at the border of the model domain, after we import the forcing data, what boundary conditions are applied on the top of the model? Is it the same as what is applied on the sides? Um, the 1D boundary conditions are the conditions coming from the ground up to 2.500 meters. So only um, up to the top of the 3D domain, maybe 500 meters, these values from the one dimensional um, boundaries are then applied. So if we have a value for 450 uh, meters, this value is then applied to the 3D core model area. So that's, uh, that's, why, we, um, that's why I showed you the, the small scheme in the beginning. Um, the 3D core model area is always um, depending on these one dimensional um, inflow conditions. Would you say simple forcing is enough for a general study of green roof effect on neighborhood scale? Um, yes, of course. There's, it's the question is, yeah, what is your purpose of the study? So um, there are lots of scientific studies, for example, um, where we have also field measurements. And if you have field measurements, um, it's of course much more accurate to compare these field measurements where you also have the exact solar radiation conditions. Um, and if you want to compare them to your model results, you would need the full forcing to do that. Because in simple forcing, you're just always defining the same conditions. So it's always cloud-free. It has to be cloud-free. And if there's a cloud at 12 midday and you simulate its air temperature drops of maybe 2 Kelvin, and you model it in simple forcing, and you don't find this 2 Kelvin drop, it's because there were no clouds in the model. But if you used full forcing and you measured that there was a cloud at 12 midday, um, the solar radiation is also reduced in the model. And then there will also be an air temperature drop in the model. So if you want to compare it to real measurement data, it, should be it would be better to use full forcing. Um, but if you just want to compare scenario A, scenario B on a hot default day at that model area location, simple forcing should be. Ah, where are the radiation? Uh, where are the radiation attached to the model at all cells or where? Uh, the radiation is attached um, at the top of the atmosphere. So uh, if we have direct radiation coming in, of course, and there's somewhere a skyscraper at the top, um, the radiation is of course hitting that skyscraper and reducing, of course, the direct radiation which is then received at the ground level. Um, so that's yeah, I think I think pretty pretty clear now. Um, yeah, you, so I can create the forcing file by hand. Yes, of course, you can create such a file by hand. Um, if you mean by hand, by, by clicking and entering the values, I would say better not. Um, but if you mean that by um, doing it with a code, um, of course, yes. Yeah. So um, if you have some kind of data set already loaded in R or Python and then uh, write a short script, write it as JSON. This is the tag name, for example, wind profile and add these tags in there with height information, wind speed value information, um, and wind direction value information with these tag names and the value. The JSON file is written very easily, very quickly. Um, so yes, if you are able to do that, do that. Yeah. So that's a very good idea. Yeah. How reliable are EPW files as sometimes these files don't have all the data covered? For example, maybe the wind speed. Uh, yeah, that's true. Um, in the one file that I loaded before, there was one day where we have zero meters per second for some of these time steps, which is also not reliable. Yeah? Um, and also, if we have the data, it still doesn't tell us if it is reliable or not. Usually, um, in our um, experience, these conditions may come from an airport condition. That's why we have these high wind speed situations. And they are not very urbanized. And we are usually simulating, of course, urbanized conditions. Um, so these wind speeds are very high. Um, temperatures might not fit very well. Um, so EPW files are an easy way to get some meteorological data information and to run your simulation with somehow um, urbanized or not urbanized, but um, yeah, location um, conditions for your model area location. Um, but it would be better if you find somehow a measurement station nearby where we have reliable data from a weather service um, which we can then use. Yeah. Does full forcing take more time than simple forcing? 
Um, I would say maybe a little bit, um, but it's not drastic. Um, so if you are um, thinking about um, percentages, maybe 5% or something like that, it depends, of course. Uh, if you have a lot of changes in wind speed and wind direction, um, the model has to be updated a lot more often. That is one of the uh, reasons why we usually tell, uh, why we usually tell people, and why we usually don't do it, um, to force the wind speed and direction, as I told you before, because it takes a lot of time and it doesn't help you a lot. A lot if you have these changing conditions for the wind direction and more or less wind speed, it doesn't help you with the results. Yeah, it makes them even harder to interpret them. Um, so that is also um, one factor that we can save some simulation time if we. Um, don't force the wind speed. But if you just force temperature, humidity, and radiation conditions, um, that's of course fine. Yeah? So that should not take much longer than, than full forcing. Um, how to change the boundary conditions in the model? What boundary conditions are suitable for best model performance? Um, yeah, how to change the boundary conditions is what I sh showed you in the beginning. So if we go here into the meteorology section, we can change between simple forcing and full forcing. Um, I would not go into detail about the other LBCs. Yeah, lateral boundary conditions would be um, open or cyclic, um, but they are more or less in legacy mode, so they, I wouldn't recommend to use them. Um, and yeah, most suitable um, are likely the full forcing conditions because we have these connections between the rad radiation conditions and temperature and humidity conditions that are maybe, hopefully, actually measured. If you don't use EPW files, but measured conditions. Uh, hi, thanks for the good explanation. How to get data for low, medium, and high clouds as an input in simple forcing. Are there any conversion formula from the available solar data? Um, if, you ha if you have solar radiation data, um, please use full forcing instead. You know? um, because that is very accurate then, and you can change these conditions for every day, as I said, not only for one 24-hour cycle of temperature and humidity, but maybe do several days, for example. Um, usually you get um, low, medium, and high coverage data from weather services. Yeah? So measurement stations not always measure the solar radiation, but cloud coverage, at least in Germany. That's, that's pretty common that we have cloud coverage data in eighths. So um, that data is much more easily um, accessible um, than, than radiation data. Um, so I would not I recommend you to convert your data to um, a lower accuracy by going from radiation data down to cloud coverage data. Because what the model, the model does is to calculate radiation conditions out of these cloud coverage data. And that's, of course, less accurate than having the real radiation data. If there's no info related to the specific date in the EPW file, does the FOX file still work? Mm, I don't think that I understand that question because there is a specific date in the EPW file. Yeah? So, for example, the 16th of March is safe in the EPW file. That we, that's why we can access here. here. Um, and if I take that day in my simulation, this data is taken out of the FOX file and then used as simulation data input. In what cases would you recommend using the other LBC? Basically, never, right? Yeah, basically, never, right? Yeah, that's that's exactly the thing. Yeah, so that's only for very advanced users. So lateral boundary conditions like open, cyclic, um, yeah, should not be used um, anymore. So if you are really, really an expert and want to try something out, and um, yeah, then then. Uh, yeah, you could test it out. Maybe it works. Uh, we never, we, we didn't use it actually for, for a few years now. Um, maybe it doesn't work anymore because of parallel processing. I think we tested it backwards um, at that time when we um, inf included uh, parallel processing um, and it didn't work then. And so we never touched it again, but maybe it works again. Yeah, so if you are into the testing, you could do that. Um, you meant the year. I think that's also related to that question. Ah, okay, the date regarding the year. Yeah, so the year doesn't matter at all um, because all we do is um, simulating for the default year. It's 2000, 2018 because the year is not matter. It doesn't matter in, in our model. Um, 
if you want to simulate specific conditions, for example, in the year 2050, um, then you would change the air temperature, for example, and maybe the radiation conditions, or maybe the CO2 values, um, but nothing else changes. So we don't have any specific solar uh, cycles included or something like that. So the year doesn't have any impact on the simulation at all. So you shouldn't be bothered by that. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I know I understood your question. Yeah, so that's that's not important at all. Okay. Okay, that's that was a pretty long uh, Q and A session. So I think the last uh, fifteen minutes uh, I will do shortly uh, um, in the CSV import and maybe some some leftover questions. Um, so I will just uh, hide the comment again. So we are back at the screen here, and I will go back to our forcing manager again. Where would now now like to import CSV files? Not the EPW files or TRY files anymore, but CSV files. And as I said, they are usually coming from other models or from your own measurement data from a field campaign or from official measurement stations. Um, and usually you will get the data in, for example, one minute measurement intervals or one second measurement intervals. Um, you could import it, uh, I think, in, in a least resolution of, of one meter, uh, of one a minute or two minutes or something like that. But of course, you would then have to update the model um, every two minutes because you have new data for every two minutes. And that's a lot of computational amount and it takes much longer. So what we usually do is then averaging the data for, for example, half an hour intervals or one hour intervals. The maximum is two hour intervals. Um, a few years ago, a um, few versions ago, it was um, fixed to half hour intervals, but that's not um, that's not the case anymore. So you can now put in, I don't know, 10 minute intervals or one hour intervals, whatever you like. But you have to average the data. Yeah? Um, and what you then have to do is prepare, prepare such a file, for example, in Excel or in R, where we have a few columns. And you can see which columns you need in this import dialog here, import from CSV, where you find the date column, which has to be in this format, exactly that format, yeah? Day, day, dot, month, month, dot, year, 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 yeah? As we see here. If it is somehow switched or, yeah, with our characters, it will not work, right? And also the same for the time, yeah, which has to be in HH and so on, yeah? Um, and we do have columns for short wave direct radiation, short wave diffuse radiation, long wave radiation. As you can see here, there's a slash, yeah? And the slash shows you it can also be cloud coverage data. If you have radiation data, fill that in here and define it as radiation data. If you have cloud coverage data in AIDS and no radiation data, you have to switch to cloud coverage data here, yeah? force cloud cover. That's very simple to understand because uh, if you enter a, um, cloud coverage data here, which would be in a range of zero to eight, maybe we have to enter a value of eight because it was a very cloudy day. And we tell MEMET that was radiation data, we would have eight watts per square meter in our model, which is not, a, not enough to run a very uh, um, hot summer day. Yeah, So uh, you have to, of course, change that if you have cloud coverage data or nothing at all. But if you have nothing at all, you will still need these columns. Yeah? Add these columns, give them a header, but enter zeros for all columns. It doesn't matter. You have to click do not force radiation, and you have, the, have to have these columns anyway. Um, then you have to enter the uh, air temperature values in Kelvin, not in degrees Celsius, very important. You have to enter the relative humidity values, wind speed values, wind direction values, and precipitation values. And also, like for the radiation columns, if you don't have precipitation data, and if you don't want to have it in your model at all, it doesn't matter. You, you, don't, don't can, you cannot um, delete the column precipitation. You always have to add the precipitation column, just add it, put in zeros and you're done, okay? The structure has to be like that. Uh, and then you save it as a CSV file. Oh, I have not opened it yet, but we can have a look at it, of course, as well in the text editor. And we now see that we have these columns here. We have a header where we have the column names. Um, we have the structure for all of our variables here all of our param parameters, and we have a separator for our columns, which is now here a semicolon, 
and a decimal separator, which would be a comma in this file. Yeah? But of, that, of course, varies. Yeah? Usually, of course, the English format is a comma as a separator for the columns and a dot for a decimal separator. When we now import a CSV file, we, of course, select it first, load the file here. And then we have a preview here, which is helping us a lot because it tells us which kind of um, data is read and how it is read. And we can see here that it's clearly not loaded correctly. Yeah? The, the import was not, um, was not uh, done correctly here. Um, so we would have to change the value separator and decimal separator because we saw a second before that the value separator is a semicolon and that this decimal separator was a comma. And now the data would be loaded correctly. And we have a header. If we uncheck that button here, of course, um, the importer would think that the first row also has data, which is not the case because there stands date, time, short wave direct radiation, and stuff like that. So there is a header. Now we need that button here. Uh, we have radiation data. So we have to force radiation. Um, and we have to enter the heights and which height was air temperature and relative humidity measured. Usually it is the two meter height. Wind speed interaction at official stations is always, um, is usually um, measured in 10 meters, right? Um, if you are in a field campaign and measured the wind speed at a two meter level, for example, you would have to enter it here, of course, yeah? because it makes a huge difference. If we have measured two meters per second and 10 meters height, that would be a rather low wind situation yeah? because of the roughness length um, above the ground. The wind profile would show that we have rather low values near the ground, and then up to two meters per second in 10 meters height, and I don't know, four meters, five meters per second, and 2.5 kilometers height. If we measure it closely to the surface, for example, one, meters, one meter above the ground, um, two meters or even three meters per second would be a lot. It would be a very stormy situation. And the wind profile would be already at three meters per second at one meter above the ground. So it would reach that value um, more early. Um, and then we earlier, and then we would have a different wind profile. So this value here is very important at which height level um, we would um, we have measured the wind speed. Um, and of course, this is not the value in meters per second, but the um, height level for air temperature and relative humidity um, where we measured that. But usually it's 10 meters for the wind speed and two meters for air temperature. If you have in different heights, of course, change that here, right? And this tag here is also quite important. Um, at, more or less asks if you have really measured data of radiation at your measurement station, um, which is usually at a horizontal surface, um, or if you have the data from a model, which is usually um, giving you data um, perpendicular to the sun, which is also um, the data that EnviMed needs in the end, yeah, perpendicular to the sun. Um, and that is why we would um, recalculate the values if they are measured normally, um, so if you check that box, the data is more or less recalculated um, after, uh, yeah, not after the import, but during the simulation then. Um, we don't see that um, very clearly in the results then, but in the morning and afternoon hours, um, if the data was not measured on a horizontal surface, but coming from model, we have large discrepancies in these, um, in these border hours, morning and afternoon hours. Yeah. So after that, we import the data and we see now that we imported first the EPW file and now the CSV file, and we see that it came on top. Yeah? We see not only the yellow colors here for the EPW files, but also the green colors for our CSV and file import. Why is that? That happens because we always take the last import to be on top of all the others and delete all the information which has been in there before. If we check the data now, we can see that this is not the EPW, APW file data anymore, but the new data that we loaded just from our ZSV file. Yeah? Clear sky conditions, temperature, humidity, wind speed, wind direction. And why is that helpful if we do it like that? That would be helpful if we want to run a very long simulation, for example, from 1st of September to 14th of September. Um, and these two weeks would only be covered um, if we take APW file data and our CSV file data. Yeah? Our CSV file data would only cover this, these five days here. Yeah? That would not be enough. Maybe we only have one day of measurement data, but we want to simulate three days. 
then we would need to import EPW file data first and then the CSV file data. If we do it the other way around, that would not be helpful. Yeah? If you just import the CSV file again and then import the EPW file, it erases the previously loaded um, time steps yeah, here in September because it says, okay, I'm the new data and new data overrides everything that has been before. And there was data uh, from CSV file import. Never mind. I have data for the same time, same time period and I'm coming next. So I override everything. So last one wins. Yeah? Um, so that is why we usually recommend to first load in um, the EPW file data if you want to go take into both. Um, and then the CSV file data. Yeah. Okay. Um, then, then don't forget, maybe as, as the last thing before we do uh, last uh, Q&A section here, um, if you have only some parameters, for example, temperature and humidity and wind speed and wind direction, it might also be useful to use full forcing even if you don't have um, one of the other parameters. Um, that would still be fine. Yeah? So you can import them here nevertheless, but keep in mind that you then have to um, click do not force this parameter in the envy guide in the end. Yeah? If you don't have any relative humidity, for example, you have to click do not force relative humidity, of course. Yeah? Just, otherwise you're importing no data values and then you want to force with these no data values, which is of course not working in the end. Yeah? Um, and if you don't have the long wave radiation values, which is more or less common. Yeah? We often have um, direct radiation values, diffuse radiation values for measurement stations, but not always long wave radiation values. That is the only component where you can put in zeros yeah? for the whole column. In the Excel file, for example, I would put in not a random value like, or maybe an average value of 380 watt per square meter as we have here in the file, but zero. If you put in zero here, we can still force the radiation in our model and it takes the short wave direct values and the diffuse values as well. And it calculates automatically within the model how large the long wave radiation values would be. Yeah? So that's one last um, tip maybe or hint that I can give you. You could enter zeros there to let the model calculate the long wave radiation values. Okay, I think. That's enough of sharing here. And I will go back to the last few comments for last Q&A session. That overwriting is very interesting. So last one wins, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so um, that's why the, um, yeah, why it's important to first import the year long data and then the uh, specific data, for example, from the CSV files. Can we run simulations for the whole year in a short time of the model run? Uh, yeah, in a short time, no. <laughs> so uh, we did that in the past, um, but you have several problems. The first problem is sometimes you have random crashes. Like for example, you did not expect that there was a wind speed of zero meters per second in April, for example, and then the simulation crashes. Um, and then you have a problem because you would have to run at least a few hours again, um, to, or a few days again, to have an overlap. Um, so you have random crashes, maybe because there's a restart of the PC or something like that. Um, and of course, the soil gets dry. Um, and if you have a long heat period, the soil gets dry very fast and the photosynthesis cannot take place anymore. So you would definitely have to check the precipitation values to then add humidity back into the soil so that uh, vegetation is working again. Um, what we did when we tried it once was to do two week simulations, the same model area in two weeks. Um, and then the first two weeks of the year, the second two weeks of the year, and so on and so on to cover the whole year and always with an overlap and then attach the files again to each other, which was a very large amount of effort. Um, but in the end, we were able to then create um, a file to do a BPS simulation, a building performance simulation, which such data, which was provided from microclimate modeling for the BPS simulations. Uh, how impactful are the roughness length values in this simulation as they change for different case scenarios? Um, yeah, I would not change them between the different case scenarios um, because um, you provide these values at the inflow border, right? Um, and you want to have the same wind inflow um, at the borders, maybe coming from a field nearby, even if there's no field, I know, 
um, to be comparable between the scenarios, right? Um, so I would keep them in general at, at the default level to make your life easier, you know? um, to not, uh, yeah. Add another parameter, which can be different between different scenarios, right? If you change too many factors at once, um, you cannot um, tell, okay, it was the greenery that I applied, which now um, reduced the air temperatures in my model or improved the thermal comfort overall. So you cannot be sure if it is maybe because you change also the reference length at the inflow boundary. Uh, inflow bo uh, boundary. Okay, so I think that was the last question for the day. So thank you very much for joining, joining our live demo today. Um, yeah, and have a good day. Goodbye.